Okay, we're going to uh, get started on learning module two. This is uh, going to be for week two, and we're basically now diving into the uh, software development lifecycle. And um, specifically, we're going to be talking about lifecycle management as it relates to uh, learning module two is planning and analysis phase, more of an emphasis towards the analysis phase, even though analysis phase is kind of like step two uh, you got to do the planning stage first you actually you don't have to you run them in parallel really um, however I'm going to just introduce the planning uh, uh, phase and then I'm going to dive into the analysis phase and then learning module three will come back to the planning phase um, yes there's some kind of method to the madness and we, we can talk about that so all right, so jumping right in, here's the uh, topics that uh, we're going to be going over, understanding the problem and determining scope, determining requirements, um, feasibility, and then review and revision of requirements, how we need to make sure they're the right requirements, how we've got to make sure we manage them and control versioning of them and all that good stuff. All right, so remember our development life cycle we kick things off by entering in pretty much the uh, planning phase where we try to understand the problem um, this is a reuse of learning module one I just want to kind of set the stage so we are in the planning um, phase is where we're at we're pretty much defining the system to be developed that's our objective and we're setting the project scope and then we are going to develop the project plan, including the tasks and all that good stuff that management does. Anyways, that third activity is learning module three. That's what I'm referring to. Okay, we're going to talk about learning module one and two in this. I'm sorry. We're going to talk about uh, activities one and two in this learning module, and then we'll talk about activity three in the next one. Okay. So our first couple of steps, and they aren't done. Look at this real quick step one and step two they aren't done in sequential fashion this is not an algorithm this isn't a robotic where you do procedure one and all this kind of stuff you got to do these things you got to be agile in doing them okay we're trying to understand keep in mind our goal our objective we're trying to understand the problem that needs to be solved what kind of system needs to be built that's what we need to understand and we need to start understanding it now and then as we're understanding that we need to start establishing what the scope is meaning what system are we going to be what are the boundaries what won't it be what aren't we building okay so if i'm building a spacecraft that's going into space we need to delineate that oh i'm not building the rocket that the spacecraft is going to ride on in order to get into space i'm just building the spacecraft and that's what i mean by the scope we've got to make sure we identify the boundaries of the problem which we're trying to solve okay all right, uh, let me try to find my uh, keys here. All right, so we're talking about the system scope, um, defining the system and its scope. Sometimes some organizations, some projects will start off with what they call a project charter. And that basically is kind of like an agreement to get things started. You can get resources allocated to you so that you can start understanding the problem. Okay, project charter typically will contain this kind of information. Okay, whether your organization will do it or not, I'm not sure, but you need something to really just kickstart the activity. Okay, identify the preliminary schedule, meaning this is how long we're going to take to understand the problem. Some projects it might be we're going to spend a week, some projects might be a day, some projects might be three years. It depends on the type of problem that you're trying to solve. Okay. Or, keep in mind, we might not be solving a problem. We might be able to try to improve efficiencies in an organization. So we might be building a software application to improve the efficiencies of the organization. So relative to that, we might be studying the problem. In, in that example is we might be studying the organization's processes. Okay, Because we're trying to understand what aspect of the process is taking so long. Because that's the area that we might want to, it might be advantageous to build a, a system to help make it more efficient. Or we might be building an application, a, a, an art, a widget of some kind, so that an organization can take effect, uh, can take advantage of a new market. Okay, so they might be saying, you know, new type of uh, uh, recording device or a new type of phone. I don't even know where my phone is, but. Um, and so we're not solving a problem. We're, we're under, trying to understand how, how the organization uh, is trying to move forward and how could the product best meet what their strategic objectives are. So there could be different reasons why we're building, a, we're building something 
a problem is, is just one of those examples okay anyways at this point we might kick off a project charter that basically initiates um, this step of the process where we're going to go off and start understanding the problem okay uh, with that some things that we can do um, to understand the problem here's some strategies that we can we can take we can take a root cause or cause and effect so if we're trying to actually solve a problem then we need to understand what actually caused the problem uh, duration analysis deals with like I was saying if we're trying to make the organization more efficient uh, we're going to understand um, what aspect of the process actually takes the most time duration so you, you basically model the organization's processes and then you allocate, you attach the time that it takes to um, to do that process. You could also do a cost um, to where instead of uh, assigning time uh, or duration to a task, you could also assign time to the task or, I mean, dollar amounts. How much does it cost us to do that task? Um, and what we're looking for are those areas of the organization that are inefficient. And so we might be building an application, a software system, a widget of some kind that will actually help uh, improve that process. Okay, You might think about it like what's involved for a student, you all are students, what's involved for you students to register for classes. Think about every step that you have to go through in order to register for classes. And mark down for each of those steps, identify how much time it takes to do each step then step back and holistically look at the entire process and identify which step takes the longest amount of time then based on that assessment look at that step and say what kind of software system could I build in order to reduce the amount of time that it takes to do that step with that you're, un you're starting to understand the problem and you're st starting to understand which step of this entire uh, you know process the entire process of scheduling for classes which step is the most problematic or the one that we need to make uh, become more efficient that's you starting to define the scope as well as the understanding the problem that you're trying to solve okay does that make sense <clears throat> um, the good thing about videos you can always back up and listen to things again however you can't create <laughs> uh, information so you can't back up and ask a question however feel free to flag these areas write a comment or a question down in the comments below or you shoot me an email um, and we can talk about it uh, in depth um, okay another uh, strategy you can take to understand the problem is something called benchmarking where you look at uh, how is it solved by other organizations so back on scheduling classes how do other universities uh, schedule classes and so you might study that um, and look at differences and whatnot compare and contrast and then you, you could uh, conduct interviews uh, interview with end users interview with organizations management uh, just conduct brainstorming sessions get some smart people together and say hey look here's what we're trying to solve let's make sure we understand this what's the scope of it and all that good stuff uh, the point being is you've got to come out of that step with a good understanding of the problem like for example we know the that process step that we're trying to improve for scheduling classes we know it exactly we've modeled it we are establishing that as our scope we've got to come out of the planning phase with multiple things uh, the, the things I'm highlighting now in this learning module is that we've got to come out of the planning phase with a good understanding of the scope and a good understanding of the problem okay now I'm, I'm now transitioning into the analysis phase and so we might say why did I bring up learning, you know, say that the planning phase is going to be finished in learning module three? Well, I want to talk about planning uh, more in depth. I want to talk about planning relative to project management. And I want to go into in depth about uh, that because that's going to be a big role and responsibility on, on your all's plate as industrial engineers. And so, uh, number one, it has to be another learning module. That's just all there is to it. However, I didn't want to start talking about I didn't want to talk about that 
and then transition into the analysis phase because the key point that we've got to make sure we understand is that when we come out of the planning phase we understand our scope and the problem if I made all of this part of the same learning module I would then transition to project management discussions and then we might forget this important step that we understand the scope and the problem while we're immersing ourselves in project management concepts and so I didn't want to do that um, so learning module three I'll come back to um, this planning phase and talk about project management uh, expectations and things like that for now the takeaway for us is that we have um, come out of the planning phase uh, and we might come back into the planning phase I mean it doesn't mean it's not we're not waterfall where it's sequential you once you leave a phase you, you can never come back that's not the point The point is we've got to be very iterative um, and we've got to be very adaptable making sure that we think we uh, understand the problem and we've defined the scope well enough okay now, in doing that, we need to also make sure we start documenting what that is so that we can control it, configuration management. We don't want it changing. Remember from Learning Module 1, scope creep. We don't want it changing on us haphazardly. Can it change? Of course. But we want to be able to manage that change. Okay, so we want to put it under configuration management control. We'll talk about that in like Learning Module 7 or 8. I have to look at the schedule. Um, what configuration management control looks like, okay? All right, so we've exited the planning phase. We kind of we understand our problem and the scope, and we're starting now to, uh, the analysis phase. And so, uh, like I said in Learning Module 1, this is the most critical step of the development life cycle. This is where we're now going to get a handle on not only that problem, but now what a widget needs to do in order to actually solve the problem or whatever it is that we defined in the planning phase. So everything's going this is this is the, the the you know we're climbing a, a mountain face and these are the handholds that we're putting on the rock uh, these have to be uh, very secure and stable because uh, everything's going to be based on the requirements and so that's why uh, this step is 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 deemed the most critical okay our purpose during this time is to identify what and now I've bolded and underlined the word what what the software needs to accomplish not how it needs to do it a lot of times where we mess up is that we fall or we get into the habit of uh, trying to design the solution right now and, and that's not what we're trying to do we could care we're, we're solution agnostic right now we're trying to identify what the software needs to do okay now there's going to be different ways that we, we can do this uh, we're going to be defining requirements but there's different kinds of requirements that you can define uh, that you can define the standard uh, requirement that exists uh, in the majority is going to be a functional requirement and that's where you state uh, what an individual feature of the software is okay so it's got to be able, the software uh, shall process commands an individual feature so if you send the software a command it's got to be able to process it uh, it's got to be able to authenticate users uh, to make sure you know you, you're a valid user in the system individual features that's what a functional requirement is it defines um, a feature of the software okay a non-functional relates to more of the system level aspects of the software or the characteristics of the software okay sometimes we call them quality like requirements when you talk about how maintainable the system has to be how reliable does the system have to be those are more non-functional okay uh, we'll, we'll talk about an example here in a second of these then you might have a process requirement now process requirements are more design uh, constraints if you will and that you might levy um, you know the software has to be developed using an agile development process okay that's a constraint that's levied upon the project uh, the stakeholders might be one to force it um, it might be part of a contract uh, it might be be part of a uh, response to a request for proposal I mean there's many reasons why but when you have a requirement like that we typically label them as a process requirement and that'll, that'll the reason why we do that is it dictates how much analysis we're going to do to truly understand the requirement 
Meaning, if you tell me I got to develop using an agile development approach, I'm not going to try to figure out uh, what are all the best development methodologies. Because guess what? I'm taking an agile approach. It's it's a process requirement levied upon me by the per the person paying for this, so I've got to do it. Um, and then you've got this concept of emergent properties, um, not necessarily requirements. Uh, but an emergency, emergent property is something that you typically don't plan for, and so it's it's actually more important during the design phase or whenever you're architecting a solution. Um, emergent properties are something that um, results in an aggregation of individual features, and so you might have one component of the system doing something and another component of the system doing something, and since they both did the individual features, then you kind of have this systemic or the system level emergent property to emerge. Okay, uh, I know a lot of buzzwords thrown around there. Think about this: when you drive on the interstate, you're driving on the highway, and you come upon a tunnel in the mountainside. Okay, and there's typically a sign there, right, that says "Turn on your headlights." Okay, what typically happens when everybody enters a tunnel? If you think about it, what's the human behavior of what everybody typically does? Typically, what everybody does, and this was studied by uh, Department of Highways. This isn't something I came up with. Um, but typically what happens is everybody slows down. Okay? And that is not a requirement. Um, the, the speed limit um, is set at whatever point prior to the entering the tunnel. There's not a special speed limit established on entering a, a tunnel. However, the human behavior is that once we're entering the tunnel, for some reason, everybody slows down. That is an, emer an, an emergent property. That's something that just has surfaced that people do based on combining individual components of the system, meaning you're driving a vehicle, you're entering a tunnel. By combining those two things, you've got an emergent property that surfaces. Okay. Well, that happens in software a lot. When we build a component A and component B, the minute we integrate them together, we kind of have the system creates this new behavior that we really weren't expecting. Okay. Um, and we could talk more about that. There's actually a good book out there called Emergence uh, that talks about software systems and how to try to how to try to manage emergent properties. So. All right, um, <clears throat> let's go into this a little bit more. Some more examples of like non-functional requirements. Uh, you got product metrics, uh, process metrics, uh, and whatnot. Um, he, one other way to think of non-functional, the main things to think about when we're dealing with requirements are kind of like these two categories, functional and non-functional. That's the majority of your requirements, okay? And so with that, when you have requirements to talk about, you know, we've got certain data throughput or uplink and downlink speeds, for example. If you see that there's a need for the system to have certain uplink speeds for data throughput, then you're dealing with a non-functional requirement, a characteristic of the software versus an individual feature, meaning you've got to uplink um, data. Okay, that is a, a functional requirement. Now when you're thinking about that feature, uplinking data, when you start asking questions like quality-like questions, how reliable does that uplink need to be? How fast does that uplink need to be? Those characteristics about that functional requirement, those are non-functional requirements because you're describing that functional requirement, what it needs to look like. Okay, So that's the difference between functional and non-functional. Um, no matter what kind of requirement they are, the one thing you have to make sure they are that they do have as far as a characteristic is that they are verifiable. You've got to be able to show that when a system is built that says it satisfies the requirement, we need a way to be able to verify it. We have to be able to test and execute the system so that we can determine, does it actually do it? Does it meet that uplink speed? And so that that attribute is verifiable, meaning when we write requirements, we have to make sure they're verifiable. Okay. So an example of a non-verifiable requirement is the software shall have a good interface for the users. You see that a lot 
in requirements. Well, what is a good interface? What is the, so it's like taking a test on an exam. If I'm not clear of what answer I'm looking for, then there, it's very ambiguous. And so how are we going to judge whether or not the software actually does what we want it to do? If we're ambiguous in our requirements, then we're not going to be able to check or grade the solution that gets built. Okay. So what drives that is whether it's verifiable or not verifiable. That's the attribute. That's the quality attribute that we're looking for. And so there's a point in time, and we'll talk about it at the end of this learning module, is as we start generating our requirements, these requirements are going through a validation step to where we are making sure that these requirements are the right requirements, but also the other step we're doing is we're making sure that we're going to be able to verify them. So we're catching these problems now, basically, okay? And then some more examples of uh, requirements. All right. Uh, another topic to really, this is kind of like definitions, uh, the stage of definitions, make sure we're on the same page. When we talk system versus software, at the system level, this is what we're, we typically take our system level requirements, and as we decompose them, we're trying to identify what the software needs to do so that the entire system can be realized. And so in the software vernacular, uh, we are under analyzing and understanding what the system is supposed to do, and then we're partitioning off, well, what does the software need to do in order to satisfy the system? Okay, so it's like this parent-child relationship. Here's the system. Here's everything the system has to do. So you can look, think about a vehicle, an automobile. That's the system as a whole. Okay, then when you look at each component of the automobile, like the steering or driving, uh, cruise control, wow, oh, there's, a, there's a software feature there. Okay, what does the software need to do in order to satisfy the system need, the parent need, the cr automatic cruise control, for example? That's the parent. So that's the, the relationship between the system and the software, okay? We cannot build software without a system's understanding. It's impossible to do. You have to understand how it fits, how software fits into the bigger picture. Uh, some other definitions for us. Requirements elicitations. That elicitation, that's where we are extracting or identifying the actual requirements of the software. Requirements analysis, that's where once we get a set once we start getting a set of requirements, this is where we are actually analyzing our understanding of what we're acquiring, what we're getting, in order to try to identify more requirements more complete requirements or understand where we might have missed um, or have gaps in requirements uh, and then we're going back and negotiating more with uh, whoever we had interacted with whether it's stakeholders or whether it's users and then requirement specification is where we are actually recording or documenting these requirements whether we're taking a formal uh, modeling approach a mathematical approach or we're just writing it in English sentences in prose form um, but we have to we have to get to the point where we do document it because we're going to put those requirements under configuration uh, control. Uh, then you have system modeling. System modeling you'll see here and later on. Uh, it's a technique that we do to where we can evaluate the system. We can take a modeling approach as an analysis approach uh, to try to identify what requirements m might we be missing or what we didn't identify. And then requirements validation, what I talked about already. And then requirements management. It's everything that's going on uh, during this, this phase to make sure that we are marching along accordingly, uh, that we've come out of the planning we, phase, we understand the problem and the scope, management's making sure we're starting off the analysis phase, we're talking to the right people, whatever technique or strategy we might be taking to elicit requirements, they're setting up the meetings, that we have the resources we need, that we, when we start identifying requirements, where are we documenting these requirements, what tools are we using, is everybody trained, and so it's everything, requirements management is everything needed to move the ball from the planning phase all the way through analysis phase. I mean, that's at the end of the day, we're trying what we're trying to achieve is establish what the software needs to do, and that's what our our end prize is. 
Uh, and this was taken from a systems analysis and design book using UML. Great book, by the way. Um, example set of requirements for you, some non-functional requirements and functional requirements. So if you want to study those, you can pause the video and look at those. All right, so when we actually uh, start identifying requirements, uh, here's some techniques that we can use. Uh, we can do interviews. We can send out questionnaires. We can go s observe uh, folks in their job. We can do this thing called joint application development. We can do document analysis. We can take a use case analysis um, and user stories. And let's we'll talk about all those here later on. Um, So, but let's before we do talk about those. So, what I do want to say is I want to highlight a few things in in taking these approaches. Here's some of the challenges that we're going to be faced with. And so, as managers, we have to make sure that let's for example, let's say I'm taking an observation approach. So, what does that mean? Well, an observation approach means is I'm going to have a bunch of smart people. I'm going to have my disciplined engineers. You know, your electrical, your computer, and all that. I'm going to have my systems engineers. Uh, I'm going to have some analysts and some end users or whatever. I'm going to go observe them doing their job. So uh, if we are building an application to improve the efficiencies of scheduling for classes, we're going to go observe students actually scheduling classes. So I'm going to witness it, and I'm going to take notes to understand what you actually do during that step. Okay. So when I'm taking this approach, there are some challenges or some uh, disadvantages in taking this approach. As the manager, you need to make sure that what these disadvantages are or the challenges are, how are we as a team solving those, those challenges or those disadvantages? How are we complementing those challenges so that they don't riddle our project with faulty requirements? For example, what you're going to see here later on is during the observation, if I'm taking an observation approach, the problem is that when you observe somebody doing their activity, whether it's a work activity or whether it's a student scheduling for classes, if nobody's watching them, they're going to take a certain approach. If somebody watches them, they typically take a different approach because they're being watched. So they're going to be a little bit more formal, a little bit more rigor in the steps that they take. So you're not actually going to get a true sense of the steps that the, the typical student takes in registering for classes. Okay, And so you might not observe an authentic process step. So with that knowledge, if your project is just taking an observation approach to eliciting requirements, that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. But as the manager, you need to identify how are we going to complement that approach because we know that we're not going to get an authentic understanding of the actual process that is followed. Okay, So what you might do is maybe you have uh, a meeting um, and an observation. And in the meeting, you bring students in and you just ask them questions uh, to understand the process. Then you observe. And then you're able to marry the two ideas up, meaning this is how the students answered the questions. Now I'm going to watch them actually schedule classes. And wow, what they said during the interview doesn't actually look like the actual process that they followed. And so then you can dig deeper uh, in those areas where it might not match up. Okay. My point is, you don't just take one of these uh, techniques. Okay. You need to, depending on the type of project it is, you need to take uh, multiple approaches uh, that fits the type of system um, that you're building. Your organization also might have standard approaches that they take, um, and so that'll you know that'll get you started. However, what's key is understanding where the, what the disadvantages are with each of these techniques, so that you can put complements in place. Okay. Now, with saying all that, I'm not going to dive into each one of these in great great detail. Um, uh, I'll, I'll make sure I hit on each slide so that you can at least pause it and read it. Um, okay. So again, each one of these techniques, our job is to make sure we identify what are the functional and non-functional requirements. Okay. Uh, and then here comes some of the challenges I said or problems that you can have. So 
Um, whenever you are dealing with users, okay, they might not be aware of what their all their needs are. Meaning, you might, as a student, when you register for classes, these are the steps that you always take. Now, relative to the advisor or the university, they might say, "Well, yeah, that's what they always take the shortcut approach." That actually isn't the process. Okay, so there it might be situations where the end user they might not actually know exactly what they need. Um, uh, or they might not understand or or anything like that so you have to make sure that if you're let's say you're doing an interview where this comes into play is if you're doing interviews and I'm building a system um, and I think about end users and let's say from the end user uh, pool I might select just the students well if I did that then I'm going to get just the student perspective um, I might not be getting the advisors perspective okay so that's what this is getting at here um, and folks not necessarily understanding the their end um, end needs and whatnot uh, communication barriers uh, we don't necessarily all use the same vernacular and communicate the same way you might have folks that talk very technical uh, and if you're talking to you know end users like students and you're talking about certain types of technology that will be used uh, to schedule classes that might not be the best approach because now you're confusing uh, folks um, and, you, and you don't need to be uh, the point is is you need to be understanding what their process step is okay All right, I feel myself trying to speed up and that's probably that's not good I'm looking at the time now and I'm gonna pause it one second to reevaluate things here okay well I wanted to just look at seems like I'm taking a lot longer than I had expected just like the previous videos though it's taking me longer than I expect for some reason and I wanted to look at what's actually slowing me down so I believe it's the not really having any visual feedback on whether or not folks understand the information or if they want me to move on uh, or you know stop explain something a little bit more so maybe I'm just trying to adapt to that and taking some longer than I think so but I'm about halfway there so that's why I needed to pick up the pace a little bit so I don't want to draw this out because then it's just tough to watch so all right so <clears throat> where we were were the type of problems that you might ex experience during different types of elicitation techniques that you might find this one where we left off was you might have communication barriers who you might be talking to do you t use the same terminology and whatnot uh, the level of folks some folks you know they understand very high level some folks want to talk in detail so you want to make sure that you're talking at the same level of information as far as knowledge type of limitations you know some folks you know cannot talk about the system as a whole or talk about abstract concepts maybe they have difficulty in doing that maybe you're really good at that and you're the requirements elicitor maybe you're doing an interview trying to understand their processes and in doing so you're talking about the overall system that's being built as a whole when actually all they care about is their little process their step in the bigger process and so they might have trouble scaling to a, a to the system level and so again just make sure that you're marrying up the type of people you're interacting with what you're trying to extract from them and um, you're moving past that so let me just jump on into uh, I'll pause on this slide the last slide and um, so that you can pause on it to at least look at it but some of the technical issues that might cause some of our challenges and um, I'll let you take a look at it but I want to jump into now the actual gathering techniques some of the techniques we can use we can use interviews joint application divide uh, develop I'm sorry joint application development questionnaires and all that good stuff so I want to highlight a couple of these specifically okay interviews are the most popular technique it's where you identify uh, the set of end users or the set of folks that can best articulate what the software actually needs to do you're going to sit down with them uh, be very professional with them because you're taking time away from their job although it's expected that they do it because for the organization I'm assuming it's expected that they do it but still out of professional courtesy be very formal about it you know schedule the meeting 
come up with open-ended questions, closed-ended questions. Make sure you can get them thinking and talking about, especially if you're trying to understand their process. Okay, You want to make sure they're able to think about the entire process to give you what works well, what doesn't work well with their process, and all that good stuff. So make sure you are prepared for the interview. Make sure you follow up. Well, you make sure you conduct the interview, make sure you follow up with the interview, and we'll see this in a second. So here's some types of questions that you can make sure you <clears throat> give to those end users. Let me just jump to this real quick. Here's a, here's a neat little um, uh, breakdown of the approach that you can take, and uh, especially for following up. Make sure you summarize to them. I mean, your, your end goal is you want them to be able to verify, hey, look, I interviewed you. What I was trying to do is understand exactly what you do in your job. I'm making that up there. And I wanted to understand what you do for your job because we're building an application that is going to help you do your job. So I need to understand your job. So the point of my interview was to understand your job. This is what I took away in that understanding. So you could summarize to them what your takeaway was. And it, did, were there any action items that were taken away? Whatever. The point is you're trying to, from a post-interview perspective, respond to whoever you talk to and get them to also commit to, yeah, yeah, I believe you understood that correctly, or they could also provide you insight into what you didn't understand, okay? So again, you're interviewing folks. JAD approach, this is where we basically assemble different types of people, end users, disciplined engineers, whatever. We put them all in a room. We have folks that are there formally taking notes and we don't leave the room until we get done talking about what the system actually needs to do. So the whole requirements approach is lock everybody in a room. I'm being a little silly there. But do not let them leave until we've identified the requirements uh, for the system. Okay, that's what JAD does. Uh, questionnaires is just that. Identify what questions you need to uh, folks to answer. Identify who to send the questionnaires to and send them out to them give them so much time to respond and you know that's how you collect your data that's how you collect your requirements keep in mind that when folks see a well, only 17 percent of the folks responded and they think boy that's horrible actually response rates there's some research for you uh, if you send out a paper-based uh, approach questionnaire you'll typically get less than 50 percent uh, people responding if you send out a web you typically get less than even that that's that's kind of you think it's uh, backwards but you typically with questionnaires or surveys for example you do not get a lot of response rates high response rates so keep that in mind so you want to send out a lot of questionnaires if possible and so you also want to make sure you cover the right domain of folks uh, in order to extract the requirements so if we're doing a that application about scheduling and you're formulating the questions and whatnot, you need to also identify the type of folks that you're going to send these questions out to. So students are going to be one of them. Okay. Well, what year of students? Is it going to be freshmen only? Think about it. If you just sent the questionnaire to freshmen, you're going to get a certain you know, response, type of answers on what they want to see in the scheduling process. Well, you should probably mix it up and get folks from all different uh, academic ranks so anyways uh, here's a very generic process uh, for setting up questionnaires no need to go over in detail any of those uh, some good ideas that you can do uh, the types of questions you could have what you should avoid and all that good stuff okay and then another elicitation requirements elicitation approach is document analysis and so you might be working on an application or a system that the organization has a legacy system already. And so you're doing basically an upgrade or you're building an application to replace an old application. Well, if they have something in place already, go study the documentation they have for it. You're trying to identify what the requirements are for the new system. Well, go study the old system. Okay. 
you can do that without having to interview anybody or put people in a room doing a JAD approach or anything like that. Another technique is observations. Again, you identify uh, like with the student uh, for building an application to improve scheduling at the university. Well, we're going to go observe students how they schedule classes. Okay, But again, keep in mind, not everybody will follow exactly the, the steps that you're supposed to do because they react differently when being observed. Also keep in mind that when doing this, some folks will forget that there might be periodic activities that they need to do. Okay, So with budgets, let's just say you're following the accounting folks around and you know, you're watching them how they manage budgets or manage resources and all that stuff. And you're, you're going to get a day in the life, you know, a typical day of, a, of an accountant. And you're like, okay, good, I, I, I get that understanding. Well, if you forget, you know, the time frame of April when everybody's doing their tax preps and submitting their taxes, well, if you forgot to think about all of the activities they might do daily, weekly, monthly, or annually, then you're not really characterizing everything that that accountant does. You only caught that day in that particular time frame. So you need to also make sure that when you observe, you're also getting a good sample of their entire workload on what they actually do, all of their processes. Okay. All right, then we come into probably um, <clears throat> some of the newer techniques that have surfaced, use cases and user stories. But use cases are, are used a lot to model process threads. So if I was to actually sit down and understand somebody's day in the life, you know, what they do for a job, I could develop a use case in how they interact with automated systems. And in doing that, that's re I'm modeling it using a use case, and that you know methodical approach is giving me those probing insights into how they interact with software, other software tools, how they interact with other systems, how they interact with other people, and so in do in modeling that, that's revealing to me where the new application might need to support might need to make more efficient or just might need to do I mean it just depends on on what it might be so what I might do is I might you take a use case approach and model the student actually scheduling classes okay and I identify the student as the actor the system is the actual application to you know schedule classes and I'm, I'm basically modeling that interaction point how the user, the student, interacts with that system. What do they do? Do they log in? Yes, that's a feature. So you identify in the model them logging in. Do they see the required courses that they still have to take? So the tool automatically pops up the required courses that they need to take. Or does it do like other systems to where no, the student has to query uh, what, what classes are being offered in the fall? Okay, so you're basically trying to get to that level of detail so that we can identify what the software will need to do. So here's an example, um, and I'm not going to read this to you at all. You can pause right now and read this, but this is an example. It's a uh, it's a real example, but it's a it's it's small example so that we can wrap our minds around. But it's a security system for your homes. Okay, this is the problem statement, basically the the scope statement. Okay. So if we have something like this, then during the use case situation, taking a use case approach, we can identify, well, based on this problem definition, this scope, we can identify who the actors are, the homeowner, the sensors, the monitoring and response subsystems. And then we can identify what is the process thread. Well, the user observes the control panel to determine if the system is ready for input. If the system is not ready, the user must close windows, doors, blah, blah, blah. So we're basically taking the use case approach to identify how that user is interacting with our system. Okay. And we'll be extracting things like the non-functional requirements. That activation occurs 30 seconds after the user hits that, the key. Okay. So the use case is a methodical way to actually think about the problem definitions in the, in the scope to extract 
what the system actually needs to do, what the software is going to have to do. So by looking at this right here and taking a use case approach, we could start thinking about you know, how the user interacts with the system. And as we're thinking about that, something like this is going to pop up. That, okay, the user is going to activate the system. Okay. Well, now, when they activate the system, how quickly do you want the system to actually be armed? Okay, so this the, the use case approach makes you think about things like that. So it's very good at, at dissecting and eliciting requirements. Okay, then you could take the use, or you could take the user story approach, where you basically identify each individual feature uh, belongs on one user story. Okay, and the user story, if you remember from learning module one, has a each user story has a template, has a, a format that it follows. Okay. The point being that after we identify the user stories, these are tools for us to communicate with the end users, with the customers, with the stakeholders to make sure we've understood the problem well enough. But then as you're going to see in the planning, when we talk more in Learning Module 3 about planning, each one of these cards or each one of these user stories can then be used to identify, okay, if I was to build the system to implement that requirement, how much effort's involved? What tasks are actually needed to build that requirement in? Okay, so it's a very good management technique. It's, you, it's a reductionist approach to understanding how everything will need to be built in order to realize that user story. And so here's an example from that security system using user stories. So as a user, I want to be notified when my house is broken into so that I can get out in time. Another example, as a user, I want to quickly arm or disarm the security system for convenience. But what's the problem with these? Okay, so let's go back to, um, well, we'll get into it. Actually, I shouldn't say go back to. When we get into <clears throat> uh, requirements validation, we'll highlight this a little bit more. But let's think about verifiable or not verifiable. How would you verify this user story? What is quickly to you? Okay, and so this is where we need to, as we evolve into the, the next kind of sub-step analysis step, we need to make sure we analyze these requirements to make sure they are well-formed, written well, and we've captured all the requirements that we need to capture. So for this user story right here, during the analysis phase, we would see that, wait a second, we need to hone this in and understand what does quickly actually mean. So if the user, if you punch in the key code to arm the system, what is quickly to you? Do we want it to be armed within a second, two seconds, whatever? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so now we're transitioning into the next kind of step, the sub step within the analysis phase, and that is we actually have to do the analysis. We have a set of requirements that need to be built. Okay. Or I'm sorry, we have a set of requirements that we've elicited uh, from end users, from the stakeholders, from customers, or whatever. Now we need to analyze them. We're trying to identify: did we did we get all the requirements? What what aren't what didn't we get? Uh, where where do we have holes? How do we need to refine these requirements? Okay. I'm not going to go into great detail on this step. I'm going to highlight a few of them. Most of the time, this is where your software engineers will actually spend time doing this. Okay. I will show you an example though, so that as you are leading or managing these things. Uh, you can see that if you're seeing these types of output, then you know that it's it's the analysis step is going pretty well, okay. But the things that the software engineering is the software engineer is looking at or looking for is we're looking at different perspectives, okay. We're trying to understand in these requirements that are being that we've captured, that we've elicited from the customer and end users and all that good stuff. We're looking at these requirements from the information domain, okay the control domain so what type of events are being written about in these requirements what type of information is being written about in these requirements because think about this if we have a requirement so this is what I'm really getting at the heart of it if we heard from the end user that <clears throat> let's go back here a second where is there here's this description right here and if I'm talking about things that I'm talking about information, I'm talking about data. So there's got to be something in here. It monitors all sensors. Okay. 
So immediately as a software person, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, so this software system has to monitor sensors. So how does the system know that there is a sensor deployed out through the house? Does it pull all the electronic devices that are attached to it so that it reveals or is revealed to them who's basically connected to the system? Or does it read some configuration file? Okay, I'm flirting with the design a little bit there, but I'm trying to understand what does the users, the domain experts, the discipline engineers, what do they see relative to this product? What do they see as far as the interactions of the user? Do they want, if they install a new sensor on a window, does the user have to update a configuration file and say, hey, there's a new sensor that I've added to the system? Or does the system automatically get notified that, hey, there's something new plugged into the system? Okay, but that's what I'm doing at this analysis step is I'm trying to understand what are all what's all the information and where was I here? What are all the information and the types of events that are going on in the system because there might be new requirements that we need to be identifying based on this next level of analysis that gets performed on the requirements, okay? So we're looking at information flow, we're looking at information structure. These are kind of like the sub steps that we do. And we take a heavily, we take a modeling approach pretty heavily to do this. Uh, models represent the system. I basically take those requirements and I can model them. And that gives me a lot of insight into maybe some hidden requirements. For example, if I was to take this problem statement and extract, I basically do a simple grammatical parse and identify all the nouns and all the verbs in here. Well, what this does to me from a software person, it identifies the nouns, identify all the objects in the system, and all of the verbs identify all the functions. So we know that the software has to enable. We know the homeowner is going to have to configure the security system. We know the sensors are going to be connected. So these are features, these are requirements. Now, we won't have a requirement that says a sensor is connected to, you know, we probably won't have a requirement like that. But here's one, we definitely need to make sure we have a requirement that the homeowner can configure the security system. Well, what does configure mean? And so from a software perspective, during this analysis step, we are refining what that will actually look like. What are the requirements for that actual feature, okay? And here's an example of what it might look like. I might take a data flow diagramming approach where what the data flow diagramming approach during the analysis phase, again, this isn't something that you all will be doing, but you all will be managing and leading these types of projects, so we've got to make sure our engineers are doing it is we're identifying how the data is actually flowing through this system okay the whole purpose is how data is flowing through the system we can see that the control panel interacts with the user via user commands and data a password is sent to the to a function okay so this is the data and it's flowing through the system well as we look at and here's just another view of the a data flow diagram so it's just another view again don't get too hung up on this stuff because we're not going to learn modeling in this class but it's something that's done during the requirement step it's done during the analysis step as we extract requirements we start modeling these things to basically understand the next level of detail for the requirements so as I model them I might see something like well I've got the homeowner's got to configure the system. Oh, wow. So I might have discovered a new requirement here that we're going to need a file system so that we can store our configuration files. Will it communicate over the Internet? Uh, and so we might store it in the cloud. Or and Again, I'm starting to flirt with design, but I, I just need to... I'm, I'm using those as pressing questions to understand does the user, you know, how they might configure the system. And so will I need, you know a file-based approach uh, to capture this information. Anyways, I take this approach, I'm trying to identify new requirements for it, okay? And so I can also then at this point in time start partitioning 
my requirements. And you can think of a reductionist, taking a reduction approach, to, approach here to where at the system level I've got this safe home software. I've kind of partitioned it or organized all of the features that I've identified into three subsets. You get this feature to configure the system. I got this feature to monitor sensors. I've got this feature that interacts with the user. Well, what does monitor sensors look like? Oh, well, it can poll for sensor events and it can activate alarm functions. Well, what does this poll for sensor event mean? Well, it can read sensor status. All right, you get the picture. But this is kind of like the reductionist, the hierarchy approach where I'm breaking the features down, down to their atomic level. Okay. And again, I'm doing this, this is the analysis step, and I'm doing this in order to make sure I've identified all the re requirements, okay? Now, I'd mentioned early on, when we get through all these steps, we need to close up these steps with uh, a couple of activities. One, we need to document all of our requirements. Well, here's some standards that you can use. Uh, you've got to be able to use a... a um, some kind of standard but also some kind of tooling also to help you by the way okay and then the next step we do is we go through a, a validation step we basically analyze these during the analysis we, we don't do these in sequential steps we do them in parallel so as we are identifying requirements so as I am let's go back here I thought I had I do so I've got a user story right here. Okay. So as we're identifying this user story, I am then going through this validation approach and making sure that is the requirement unique? Is it normalized? Is it unambiguous? Is it complete? Is it verifiable? I'm making sure all of these things are checked against that requirement before we say that that requirement is good. So here's the definitions for each of these. So a unique, it should be stated only once. It should be normalized so it doesn't overlap with other types of requirements. Unambiguous, that goes back to the verifiable. So is there only one way that you can interpret that requirement? Is it complete? Is it verifiable? Is it consistent? You don't want to, if consistency is, is key because you don't want requirements contradicting or negating other requirements, okay? And then another, here's something traceable or traceability is something that is key because that is guaranteed to be done on every project that you'll ever be on and that is as you've developed requirements you have to make sure that parent requirements I'd said earlier that at the system level you'll have system level requirements and then you have software level requirements you have to make sure that you've traced your software requirements to your system requirements and so you know that are all the so system level requirements do they have children Okay. Do all the software requirements have a parent? And then you also want to make sure you have correlated your software requirements to actual code, to actual tests. So you'll want this traceability through all the engineering artifacts. Okay. So that's going to be key. All right. And then to wrap things up, you will be using tools to do all of these things. Uh, some of the common tools you'll see the doors the rational IBM doors tool a JIRA tool uh, enterprise architect these are all tools that are used during the requirements management approach and or phase when you're managing requirements no matter what tool you use here's just some basic functionality just make sure your tool has these types of functions because that's what's needed to manage the requirements and you will place the requirements under configuration management Okay, which we'll talk about at a later learning module. All right. All right. Well, I hit certainly hit the hour. I hope I didn't speed up too quickly there at the end, which I might have, and so I apologize for that. Shoot me a note if something I jumped over too quickly. And as far as challenges, I've left it blank only because I've posted all that stuff on eCampus in the learning management system. So. You can have it's all on the uh, in that week, and so you'll see the reading assignment as well as the uh, discussion assignment. So, okay, that wraps wraps up learning module two, dealing with the analysis phase, and then next learning module three. That's when we'll deal with uh, project planning. All right, until next time.